So welcome again to this edition of the New Voices series um, of the School of Security Studies. Um, rarely has this uh, the name of the series more appropriate because not only are we hearing from new voices from early career researchers um, in the Department of War Studies, they will also introduce new voices when it comes to better understanding peace building and post-conflict um, resolution processes. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Sophie Haspelslav. Sophie is a lecturer in international relations. She is currently the uh, co-director of the MA in International Conflict Studies. Um, she is an expert in um, um, post-conflict resolution and peace building, and she will be talking um, uh, today um, on introducing her fieldwork on ETA as an armed actor in armed non-state actor uh, and uh, the question to what extent they have foreign policy um, capabilities and how we should maybe listen to these voices more explicitly. Um, before we move to our second uh, presenter for today, uh, we will have Vivian Jabri and Professor Jabri is going to um, discuss Sophie's work and thank you very much for making the time. And then um, we have um, our uh, final speaker and Carrie Louise Pryor. Um, who's going to, um, she's a, she's a um, final year PhD student at War Studies, uh, but it's so great um, to hear from your research. Um, um, uh, Carrie Lewis has done um, um, field work on, on Colombia, on FARC, and she's um, introducing the perspective of uh, victim-centered um, approaches to peace building, and again, introducing um, an underrepresented voice which might be quite important um, to, to um, recognize in, in peace building processes. Um, Carrie has done a lot of um, 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 a practice experience in, 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 in different post-conflict resolution contexts. Um, she's been working um, uh, for, for a number of non-state actors um, um, as well, and, and I'm sure this will also inform her talk today. And without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Sophie. And I'm Thank you very much, Stefan. I also have the huge honor of discussing uh, Carrie Dewey's paper um, after her presentation. That's really great. Uh, so thank you everyone for, for coming today. Um, my talk uh, will focus on the international relations of non-states um, armed actors, and I'm going to focus specifically on uh, what I describe as uh, ETA's peace diplomacy. Um, in the specific case of ETA, I wanted to show you these pictures. Um, what is this? Um, if you look at the pictures more closely, you will see um, uh, flags um, of non-state armed actors, uh, non-represented entities, uh, blacklisted organizations um, uh, moved in a positioned in a circle with pulpits um, in front of them. And so this was a gathering organized um, called the New World Summit. It happened in 2012. It was part of the 7th Berlin Biennale. Um, and it was kind of a half art installation and half of a political statement. And this kind of unusual event brought together not just the flags, but also some representatives um, of these uh, non-state entities. And it was really a gathering um, of representatives of these entities, but also some lawyers representing them um, and others. Um, if you look a little bit more closely at the pictures, initially you could think that what is happening here is that they're mimicking a sort of state diplomatic gathering, right, between the, the flags and the pulpits, etc. But if you look a bit closer, what you see is that the flags aren't organized in terms of geography or protocol, they're color coded. Um, there, you know, lots of different things are happening here that are quite different than a kind of normal diplomatic practice. And this is really what uh, my work uh, at the moment is, is trying to investigate. Um, I'm trying to understand how non-state armed actors do um, international relations, what international relations do they do, um, how they go about um, their, their foreign policy, really. Um, so our understanding of international relations more broadly um, has evolved and uh, isn't as constrained in a kind of uh, focusing just on state actors. But a lot of our concepts and understanding of how they go about, how we go about international relations and also how we go about diplomacy is still very much stayed in our understanding 
of the international system as a system between states. Um, and that is very much, can someone actually close the door if you don't mind? And, and that is very much premised on the, the idea that underpins our understandings of diplomacy that diplomacy happens between political units that recognize each other, that are similar, right? And that are that are the same. And so in that sense, foreign policy analysis, but also international relations more broadly has remained uh, really quite state centric. And so what this paper, but also a slightly broader uh, research project that I'm, I'm trying to um, um, develop at the moment is, is trying to unpack and analyze is really to try and help us broaden our understanding of actorness of who should be considered actors in international relations. Um, it also tries to build on uh, what already exists in terms of the literature on what's known as rebel diplomacy and tries to connect as well to notions and understandings that um, have emerged from um, critical peace and, and conflict scholarship uh, around the years, particularly in the transition of non-state armed actors um, away from violence and, and, and shifts in, in strategies. Um, so while there isn't so much literature um, in, sorry, um, in the field of, um, of the foreign policy of non-state armed actors, there's quite a rich literature that has emerged more recently in uh, comparative politics that looks at rebel governance, right? And 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 emerging from this rebel governance and this idea that you know these non-state armed actors are playing roles that have you know traditionally been associated with state actors, um, a number of authors have started to look at this rebel diplomacy. Um, and how these actors are actually uh, performing functions of, of rebel diplomats, if you like. So authors like uh, Bridget Coggins, uh, Ray Cochran, or Romain Maljac have explored some of these notions. And um, in the in the paper, um, I, I look at some of that literature uh, to try and see, okay, so how are they approaching these questions of, of rebel diplomacy? And um, a, a sort of underlying assumption of a, a lot of this literature is that um, rebels are in effect mimicking the states, right? That what they do in the international fora or the diplomatic fora is sort of a copy of what the state would do. And so it's a question of, you know, also um, being acknowledged and getting recognition uh, for that. And so what, what I'm arguing in, in a way in this paper is that um, I think this shouldn't, shouldn't be an assumption, but that should really be a research question. Is that what uh, rebel diplomacy or kind of more the, to think about it in slightly broader terms, the international relations of armed group, is that all that it's about? Is that really all only about uh, mimicking the state or not? Uh, the other element is that the, the literature tends to focus on quite sort of I guess, material elements of how we understand diplomacy. So, uh, you know, opening and up offices, representation, et cetera, et cetera. And I think when it comes to non-state um, armed actors, particularly those that have been listed as terrorist organizations, the reality of uh, the bureaucracy of diplomacy is really affected by their very nature as, you know, illegal or criminal actors, but also the, the possibility of even kind of being present in these international uh, arenas. Um, so I'll, I'll explain a bit um, why I focus on uh, ETA, uh, Skadita, Asketa Suna, so the Basque homeland and liberty um, non-state um, armed actor organization that um, declared a permanent end to its violence in 2011 and actually um, handed over its weapons in 2017. So I decided to focus on ETA and also the broader Izquierda Abrazali movement because their uh, transition um, away from violence and, you know, um, putting that kind of unilateral away, transition away from violence. Um, I, I started working on, uh, on a, during a, a previous research project that was looking at um, the impact um, that the listing of ETA's and terrorist organization was, was having on, on the organization and its transition possibilities. And what I, I quickly came to realize was that um, during that transition process, international actors and the realm of um, diplomacy played a really intrinsic part in, in that transition process. So that's really what I'm trying to explore um, in this paper. 
So um, if you like, um, in short, and that's what I'm going to be um, explaining now, um, in a situation where ETA could not uh, negotiate with the Spanish government, and we can get into that in, in the Q&A if you like, um, they, were, they, were, they were in a position where um, the only way out for them towards a, a political strategy was really a, what you if you want to describe it as a unilateral transition away from violence. So they were in a position where they had kind of no one to negotiate with and thus no one to kind of um, move, you know, in, towards an exit strategy with. And, and if you like, the international actors became that other side. And that's kind of what I'm trying to, to show and, and elaborate um, in, in this. So uh, this work is based on, on personal interviews uh, with uh, the the non-state actor itself, um, so both members of ETA and the broader Abratali movement, former members, um, also with um, international actors involved in the transition process. I was also involved uh, in a more personal capacity because at the time I was head of policy at uh, Conciliation Resources, um, and uh, we're also part of that story. So there's a slight uh, element of this um, in the in the paper as well. Um, what I'm interested in, uh, particularly, is to look at how the non-state actors themselves do diplomacy and do their international relations and then theorize from there. So my idea is really to try and flip it around. So instead of kind of applying um, our conceptual understanding of international relations and diplomacy, for which the starting point is the state, is to look empirically at how these actors are doing it and then reconceptualize from there, if you, if you like. Um, and so I, I guess there are a number of headings that come up, and this is very much a kind of an initial exploration of, of some of my field research. So um, I'm, I'm very you know, grateful for any insights and, and, and perspectives on, on some of these um, initial ideas. Um, but one of the things that that kind of came out quite quite strongly for me is uh, the extent to which these organizations have uh, representation and bureaucracy. So kind of picking up the thread from the kind of re rebel diplomacy um, literature, looking at the extent to which um, these organizations um, have uh, this this kind of um, diplomacy um, in effect, you know, in material terms. Um, and what was really interesting to me in, in the interviews is that what, what came out quite strongly is that because of the nature of the actor and the difficulties around uh, the possibility of being in the international realm, uh, what came out really strongly is that the representation was much more based on um, uh, kind of uh, informal uh, links, if you like, and trust, right? Much more than a purely kind of material understanding uh, of these relationships. So uh, in the in the case of um, ETA in particular, a lot of the relationships that were already present during war, when it came to, you know, solidarity, for instance, with other groups or even cooperation in war, um, morphed into something else during that, that transition process, but also kind of played an important role. Um, quite a lot of the actors representing ETA uh, 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 or the broader Izquierda uh, Abrazale abroad were often uh, people who were exiled or refugees who were already operating in these, uh, in these spaces. Um, and so there were sometimes attempts at establishing offices or bureaucracies, but at the end of the day, uh, most of the relationships ended up being much more person to person. And that increased obviously even more once um, ETA and political uh, movements associated with it were listed as a terrorist organization post 9-11. So for instance, even in Brussels or at the EU level, where states wouldn't engage at all with the political representation, but some individuals or organizations would be willing to engage at a more kind of uh, personal level. Uh, so maybe not on behalf of a particular organization or, or, or government. Um, the other element that came out um, Sorry, quite strongly was um, who who do the actors do diplomacy with, right? So when we understand state to state diplomacy, we understand it very much as, as this realm of actors um, who recognize each other, who have the same codes, uh, the same signals between states. 
Um, what is happening here is, is quite different, really, but is similar in the sense that there is a relationship between like organizations, if you like, right? So there are relationships happening between non-state actors. And we know quite a lot about this in terms of wartime, right? Alliances, support, solidarity, uh, whatnot. And there is quite a lot of that in the literature. But there's much less of an understanding of what this means when we think about it in terms of a transition uh, towards a peace process or, or negotiation a, a away from, from violence. Um, and so what was quite interesting as well in the, in the, in the case of, of ETA was that because of the shunning of Batasuna, the political party, from the kind of mainstream organizations, uh, mainstream political parties who didn't want any association with a listed terrorist entity, um, political parties like IRA, Sinn Féin, um, or uh, you know, the ANC in South Africa, who themselves had made transition process, were the ones engaging with um, ETA and Batasuna. And so that's a really interesting learning that how the, 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 the um, or similar organizations that would have already transitioned are engaging with these organizations that are on, on the way to, to this transition. And so these ties with these other sort of like organization became very important. Um, and it had a really big impact um, on the group and, and its own uh, transition process as well. Um, another element um, that has to do quite a bit, I guess, with almost the structure um, of the process, if you like. Um, as I mentioned initially, um, ETA in its transition process didn't have a partner to negotiate with because the government uh, of Spain uh, at that particular stage uh, would not enter into a a formal negotiation process with them. And so what you really see is that international actors came in to play that role. Um, as these different quotes uh, mention, um, one of my interviews was saying, we learned to applaud with just one hand. We could not applaud with the state. So the international community played the other part, right? They became the other hand. And so in a way, if you like, the process itself structured that possibility of, of negotiation where the international actors started playing this really important role but also very much very strongly at this symbolic level so um, this slide here um, has pictures of what's known as the Ayete conference that took place in October 2011. Why this conference was particularly important was that it was a very important symbolic moment where you had um, uh, former heads of state you had um you had um jerry adams you had jonathan powell who was the chief negotiator of the good friday agreement on behalf of the british government you had kofi annan you had these international personas and, and personalities who had been involved in a number of transition processes in in a number of different armed conflicts um giving legitimacy if you like to this process um and what happened just after this conference is that ETA declared its unilateral um, cessation of hostility, right? So as this quote from, from one of my interviews said, we needed a symbolic moment to show the end of a cycle, the start of something new. We needed something solemn. So this idea that the armed group itself couldn't just transition into nothingness, as it were, right? It, it needed that kind of process, that kind of symbolic importance, almost of, of creation in the absence of a, of a bilateral um, classical kind of uh, negotiation process. Now, one really interesting element as well in these dynamics is that um, the, the external environment and international relations of the group had a really deep impact on the internal dynamics of, of the movement more broadly and also of, of the armed um, organization. So there was this idea that by having these actors involved like um, Sinn Féin IRA or the ANC or a kind of conflict resolution organizations, et cetera, it gave um, if you like, more leeway, more credence and more uh, assurances to those within the movement who were trying to, let's say, move the organization towards a political solution, right? Um, so using codes like, say, the Mitchell principles that were, you know, are immediately associated with Northern Ireland are seen as credible within the Basque countries because of the association with, uh, say, Sinn Féin um, IRA. Um, so, um, there was this understanding within uh, ETA 
um, that, um, you know, as this first quote says, that the, you know, the armed struggle almost defines you um, and, and, and questioning the idea of the armed struggle really puts you, you naked in front of the world, right? So these transition process being so difficult and the internal elements and politics of the transition process being increasingly difficult and the role that the international actors can actually play in that, um, I think is a is a really important and interesting finding, especially in a world where any of these contacts with these organizations tends to be very much limited and, and, and constrained and, and restrained. So uh, I, I want to make sure there's space for discussion and 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 and, and Q and A. So I'll, I'll move on to some of the conclusions at the moment that are, you know, uh, still tentative because this is kind of early work. Um, but it seems very much that um, that international relations plays a key role in the transition of non-state armed groups. That they clearly are not just mimicking or mirroring the state, that something else is also going on. So there's a whole range of different actors involved, a kind of broader range. Um, they tend to focus more on the relational, on the informal, and that's something I'd like to unpack more um, uh, compared to kind of traditional diplomatic practice. Um, and that the relationship between the external and the internal dichotomy is 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 very dynamic, and I think that's kind of a very interesting also area area for for further research. Um, and and also I think that the international actors who did take part in that process took considerable risks. Um, and I think we have to think of um, how you know in in the current as well um, context how how difficult it is to be able to engage uh, with with these actors that are in the middle of these transition processes. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then I'll hand over to Vivian for a comment. So this area is very much Sophie's. She's made it her own. This idea of um, non-state actors in negotiations and conflict resolution and the post-conflict uh, arena. So it's a very, very important area to, to look at. And the questions that I have really come from my, I suppose, IR perspective, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, is interested in theory and what constitutes the international. Why is it important to look at these non-state actors? You know, why is it interesting? Because at the end of any discussion, you might say, OK, so what? Right? Where, where are we? There is a nice narrative about the Basque, about the IRA, Sinn Féin, uh, moving towards peace, laying down arms. And Sophie, you quite rightly mentioned the Mitchell process and the significance in the um, in Fein's decision making. So all of this is hugely interesting because peace is of high stakes in international relations because war is of high stakes in international relations, and we can see it now in our in our present uh, day. So this interesting question of how these actors behave, what they bring to the table, why they behave in the way that they do, and, and so on. It's, it's all crucial and very salient to our observations of how, if you like, international decision making, international conflict resolution, dynamics, how these processes work. Um, however, there are all sorts of other questions that come up and that might be considered. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm guessing that that's why I'm here yes. as opposed to <laughs> someone else who might be interested in the narratives of conflict resolution and so on and so on. So uh, with my hat on as, as uh, and I suppose an IR theorist, as a critical theorist, there are all sorts of really, really, really interesting questions that, that emerge from Sophie's um, narrative about the Basque, about ETA, and how it uh, how it behaved, its decision making processes. So there are in, there are interesting 
theoretical questions uh, that have implications for how this process is being interpreted. So it's a very interesting statement that, that Sophie made, and she's made it before. I've heard her saying this before, which is that she wants to do the empirics and then move from there to the theory. And the sentence is thrown out there, but it's a very controversial statement epistemologically in terms of knowledge and how knowledge uh, goes out there in the world and makes its case, mm -hmm. right? So uh, theory is important and it isn't so much a matter of a temporal relationship, a kind of time relationship between theory and empirics. So when do you do theory and when do you do empirics? Uh, because those empirics are always beholden to a whole set of implicit assumptions that are made. So a theory is always already there. So, you know, it, it can't be kind of put aside or not because it impacts on interpretation. And that theory in relation to the questions that Sophie is asking is actually really, really challenging and interesting. Um, Hedley Bull, he of the English school, I don't know if you're IR students, ICS students or PhD students, <laughs> or I don't know who you are, I haven't met you unfortunately. Um, uh, so Hedley Bull, who writes of international society in a particular way, um, states are important clearly uh, because political community is important. And how you understand political community is important. Where you place those limits on political community is important, right? It's important in this context because here is ETA saying, we are a political community. We represent the Basque in this area of Spain. They are making claims. So from the very beginning, they are by definition, by their very own constitutively, by their very own definition, they are all, always already international actors because they are making a claim about their political community or what they think is their political community. So theory is always already there. So, so Hedley Bull, who doesn't write about ETA, but is a very significant voice and how we understand uh, the international, not that I advocate, I come from a critical, critical side of the discipline, but Hedley Bull in the 1970s, writes an article in the journal Daedalus, which is probably in the library or should be definitely at Senate House. I remember as a PhD student sitting there at Senate House reading this article. And it's so significant because the question that he's looking at is what is the role of non-state actors? And what's not significant in this question is who they are. So he doesn't care whether they're PLO, ETA, who, whoever, right? But non-state actors as non-state actors, so non-sovereign, if you like, non-sovereign, non-recognized, and so on and so on, but taking part. He's recognizing that these actors are taking part in things that we call international and that cannot be denied. They are there taking part, right? Um, so he then concludes that because these states, these non-state actors want to behave like states, they want to be there. They want to be recognized. They want to be seen. Sometimes these actors are violent actors exactly because they want to be seen. So he concludes that they have no impact on the structure of the international. 
that the international remains as it is. So they, they are not really changing anything. They are behaving like rational actors. And you see this core assumption in Sophie's paper, which is that there is an assumption that these actors are rational actors. They're making calculations about alliances, about how they can transition from war to peace. So the ontological and therefore theoretical assumption that's being made by Sophie and throughout the paper is that these are rational actors, right? So theory is always already there. So back to this question of what constitutes the international. We can say it is an interstate system or society, Hedley Bull. But we can also say that looking at these actors, they do have an impact, that we have a, actually the international is a kind of uh, mixture of transnational relations as well as international relations, so that the international actually becomes this rather complicated space where there are states, recognized sovereign entities, legally recognized sovereign entities. There are entities that are not recognized. And this question of recognition comes into the paper as well. So you talk about, you know, you talk about recognition there. And recognition becomes then secondly, in my theoretical intervention, actually a very significant concept here because there is a dialectic going on between recognition and non-recognition. But the international is more sophisticated than that because there is a kind of blurring of the boundary between these two concepts. We might have a juridical understanding of sovereignty, the state, recognized at the UN, having a seat at the UN and so on. But even if you look empirically at the processes within the UN, non-governmental organizations are very much there, impacting on negotiations, lobbying, and so on, so that they bring into that terrain of the juridical, political, interstate space, which is really, really interesting. But they bring into that very space their kind of constitutively transnational definition. So they carry with them that space that's actually transnational. And this is really, really interesting, and we have to be curious about it. And, and it's this theoretical curiosity that then enables you to ask these questions. Because if you stick to the empirics, actually, yes, you can tell the narrative, it's an interesting narrative, but I think there's a kind of self-limiting going on. Uh, so so that, that's, that, that's um, another question, the international and the transnational. Because it raises, as I say, these questions of the spatial constitution of the entities that you're working with. And this is, this is just hugely interesting theoretically to grapple with. Um, and then we have um, Sophie very interestingly discussing, looking internally at the character of these non-state actors. Um, and she brings up very interestingly the question of bureaucracy. Um, so this too can be approached from a theoretical angle, because the minute you utter the word bureaucracy, you're not just doing, you're not just saying it uh, has a bureaucracy, it's a long running organization. I can't remember when you said it was, it came about. When did it constitute itself? It was already present before Franco. So there you go. It was already present before Franco, and we know that the Basque region is contest is a contested uh, area, and, and, and so on and so on. So um, Sophie, in her paper, tells the story. However, I, I want to argue that 
there's an interesting theoretical angle to take as well in relation to how we think about ETA or the IRA, because these guys are, as Sophie says, conducting diplomacy, right? So we can know about their diplomatic behavior by, um, if you like, adopting the rational actor model, which implicitly I think you do. Those are their calculations, their alliances, and so on and so on. You know, you don't say it, but you kind of put that, right? Um, but one has to ask the question, come back to this question, what's interesting about their non-stateness in relation to their own decision-making, right? So I've already highlighted what's interesting about non-stateness in relation to the international. So I've now moved to the moved internally. I've gone into ETA, and I want to know why they're interesting, other than the fact that they're there. The Basque region is interesting. You've probably visited it. It's contested terrain, and, and, and I would say that there are issues to be raised in relation to what this non-state as it does to um, how these entities behave. Who are they as subjects, in other words, of politics? How do we think about the subjectivity, in other words, of she or he who sits in that room declaring they are at her? Right? So questions of subjectivity become really interesting. Um, beyond that, we're interested in why they do what they do. Why, why are they behaving in this way, talking to the IRA, the IRA transition, uh, interested, becoming suddenly interested in the peace process. That's quite a long-term process. Um, and we can do a kind of cost-benefit evaluation. I think you do that without acknowledging it, rational actor model. But what else is there? Because human beings are not just rational beings. They're beings that are situated in contexts. You might have come across the notion of positionality in relation to your own research and your own uh, situatedness, if you like, right? What about the positionality of these ETA diplomats, if you can call them that, right? And how, how does that kind of change? These are theoretical questions. They're not simply empirical questions. And I think in relation to these questions, the practice turn in international relations is very interesting. So people like Paul Liu, people like um, Rebecca Adler, look to Pierre Bourdieu to understand how diplomacy works. If you look at Pierre Bourdieu, you become interested in these actors' habituations. It's what he, he calls habitus. Mm -hmm. We're all positioned, we all, uh, we don't reinvent the wheel every time. So every time I walk up the steps to my office, I'm not reinventing the wheel or getting the lift up to the sixth floor. I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm habituated into practices, right? Into the routine that I know. And guess what? That routine is through time bureaucratized. There's nothing like the significance of routine and bureaucracies because routine constrains as well as enables. I know how to go on, but suddenly something happens and my safety net is how I know how to go on in the routine. But that spells disaster when it comes to crisis and 
the capacity to respond to new information coming in. So the Bourdieusian question of uh, concept of habitus becomes really, really, really important. And just the state actors have fields within which they function. So too, yeah. um, so too non-state actors. And this is, uh, you know, the, these theoretical uh, starting points enable you to ask really, really interesting questions beyond the narrative of the specific case. And guess what? Beyond the rational actor model. I just want yeah. to thank Vivian because that was incredibly helpful. Yeah. And and just to, to, to respond that the, the interest in, in saying that I want to start off with a practice isn't so much to do something that's non-theoretical, but more that I find that the a lot of the theory of foreign policy analysis or international relations, et cetera, is so defined by state actors that it was a, an effort at kind of trying to take distance from that to reinterpret or re-understand, makes sense. But I completely agree with you that the, the kind of theoretical thinking around what is the international, who are these actors, what role do they play and can they play and how different or not they are is exactly the realm that I want to be, you know, mm. engaging with. Um, and and one of the things you said around, um, I think that, that literature is very rich, but it's very rich on non-state actors that are often assumed to be sort of benign. So like a lot of the thinking has to do a lot with non-governmental organizations or, you know, the role that they play maybe in, I don't know, environmental conventions, that sort of thing. And I remember I was in a class in Cairo University teaching on non-state actors in foreign policy. And I thought they were going to talk about Greenpeace or whatever. And all they wanted to talk about was Hamas, Hezbollah and others. And I felt like I was sometimes at loss of like theoretical ideas and concepts to kind of, you know, um, engage vis-a-vis -vis that. So I think that's really helpful. And, and the point you were making, I think the I've been thinking that a much more sort of sociological understanding and approach to these relationships and contexts is a really rich avenue. So yeah, completely agree on that. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming. Um, so my presentation is part of my PhD, or uh, at least that's what I think it's going to be. Um, it's definitely something that's more of a finding uh, rather than a theory behind uh, the interviews that I've conducted as part of my PhD. So um, the the title has changed slightly from once we first agreed uh, to to present here at the New Voices. Um, so the, the, the paper is called Finding Justice and Peace in the Midst of an Armed Conflict. So I did field research in the rural areas of North Santander, which is the border region to Venezuela and Colombia. Um, and the question of my PhD is more, what does justice mean to people on the ground that have been affected by the transitional justice mechanisms that were established in the 2016 peace agreement? But something that I found and that caught my attention was Colombia has tried to implement transitional justice mechanisms to kind of bring back the FARC EP members to a political life and to disarm them. Um, but they're still in an armed conflict, even though, of course, um, the media widely suggested in 2016 with, you know, the picture of, you know, people shaking hands and there's finally peace in Colombia. Clearly, there is not even though a lot of news agencies uh, see this differently, or also governments, I do argue that there is no peace in Colombia. Um, so I do this. So Colombia is regarded as a groundbreaking case and uh, has gained very wide media and political attention, um, especially in the context of peace versus justice. So in the Colombian um, Passed in the 1990s, there were several agreements with uh, other guerrilla groups successfully, somewhat. I mean, that's up to, for discussion. Um, and um, they have also agreed to a, a peace agreement um, with the AUC, the paramilitary groups, in the 2000s. Um, the 2016 peace agreement, however, is very different um, as transitional justice, as I just said, transitional justice mechanisms were put in place to push the country out of this conflict and into a more peaceful coexistence, if you want. Um, 
in a lot of uh, past peace processes, if you look around the world, transitional justice was used. If you look at, I mean, I'm German, if you look at the German case, the Second World War had ended and then transitional justice was put in place. So you, here you have it in a very different order, if you want. Um, well, signing the peace agreement did mark a milestone in the country's path to peace. Um, violence has uh, definitely gone down if you look at a more national context. However, I argue that or there's evidence for Norte Santander not actually living through the same. So Norte Santander is here. Pauca region uh, to the border with Ecuador. Um, and so um, what has been very, um, very different also in the last uh, peace agreement in Colombia with the FARC-EP was that it was a very inclusive um, approach to peace. So they invited different stakeholders to the negotiation table in Havana. Um, they invited 60 victims or survivors um, to uh, to sort of raise their concerns or tell their stories. And of course, 60 is very little in comparison to uh, probably around 9 to 10 million victims in Colombia overall. Um, however, it is an accomplishment in comparison both to other Colombian peace process and also to other international, um, uh, also to other peace processes. Um, of course, the uh, survivors or victims, I find this very difficult, the term just by itself, because the ones that I've, the so-called survivors, victims that I've spoken to don't often see themselves as survivor. They find this a very strange concept. Um, I think it goes more to maybe an academic kind of discussion or political discussion if asked whether they see themselves as victims. Um, also, then sometimes they couldn't even refer to themselves as victims because a lot of times they come from regions where violence is just such an everyday thing that to them it didn't even occur that this was somewhat not okay in terms of violating their human rights. Um, so, um, yes, so what I wanted to say was that the victims and the survivors didn't only suffer from the FARC-EP, but also from other guerrilla groups, of course, in the past also from paramilitary groups, state agents, uh, narco-trafficking groups. Um, and so um, for the transitional justice process to serve all victims or most victims, um, it also the 2016 peace agreement also held state agents accountable. Um, and I say this here because I did also interview um, potential perpetrators or officially perpetrators. Um, and uh, they were from other groups like military and police um, or the ELN, uh, still an active uh, guerrilla group in Colombia. Um, and for them, actually, um, it was um, it was kind of a it did give them like a platform to be able to talk, which they didn't have before because there was never such a thing like a truth commission in Colombia. Um, so for them, this also um, meant they could somewhat participate in this in this in this kind of transitional justice process. But of course, the more people speak up about the past, the more kind of let's say political chaos you stir. Um, so chapter five of the final agreement um, created three institutions. One is the Jurisdicción Especial para la Paz, which is the special jurisdiction for peace, which is a criminal justice system that fun functions very independently from the national system, um, where uh, perpetrators can confess to their crimes um, in, a, in order to avoid uh, a full trial and to benefit from the lower sentencing. Uh, then you have the Truth Commission that was tasked with investigating and documenting human rights violations of over 60 years. Um, uh, they have concluded their work in terms of they have published a final report. Um, and then you have the Special Unit for the Search of Missing Persons, which is uh, dedicated to locating and identifying individuals who were forcibly disappeared um, and collaborates closely with the other two institutions. Hmm? Yes, thank you. 
So to put the margin of truth and justice into perspective uh, from the final report of the Truth Commission that I just mentioned, these are the figures of victims um, in Colombia. So you have over 450,000 people killed um, and uh, you have also a very high number of people having been forcibly disappeared. Um, and displaced in Colombia. So this is the this is a map of Norte Santander. Um, this is an overview of current armed groups that you find in the region. Um, um, you still have, uh, and even more so now, a lot of armed groups. So basically, this is the jungle. So this is an ideal spot for armed groups, of course, to hide. And then you have the southern part, which is more of the border region. Um, so officially, before the armed, uh, before the peace agreement in 2016 was signed, there were five armed groups. Um, today you have 24. Um, of course, the power vacuum that the FARC EP, which was very strong in the region, has left behind, of course, gave, let's say, space to other groups to sort of come in. Um, and so um, what has also, apart from COVID, which made work very difficult and also a lack of willingness maybe by the Duco government hindered, um, is um, the continuous security um, situation for human rights defenders, for former FARC-EP members. I'm sure you've all heard about how many of them had been killed in the aftermath of the 2016 peace agreement. Um, in Norte Santander, you had just last year alone, 1,470 individuals that had been displaced. Um, and so what I wanted to talk today or show you and read out to you is um, interview partners. Uh, and I have interview parts from different groups telling me about how difficult it actually is to participate in the transitional justi justice mechanisms while there's still an armed conflict. So a former high ranking military official let's call him Jose, uh, played a significant role in military operations within the Katadumbo region. Um, he has taken steps to cooperate with traditional justice institutions, driven by a profound desire to reveal the truth and facilitate justice for victims, um, including to come clean for himself. However, he grapples with a daunting challenge of doing so amidst threats to his life from his own military cohort. So he's trying to, he's a former military member. He's trying to speak up about what the military has done. And of course, there are plenty of people who are not very happy about this. Um, so he wants to come clean. He has served, I, I think it was a 17 year prison sentence. Um, and he says, well, there is not much more I have to lose, but he is actually very scared for his own life. Um, so he has, and this is another point, he has organized security for himself because um, the state doesn't grant security or protection for him, let's put it that way. Um, so he had to organize this for himself. Um, so despite all these circumstances, Jose still wants to confess at the special jurisdiction for peace, um, but he's making sure that his family is leaving the country before he does. Um, and the moment that I did speak to him, he was saying, well, the moment that I do confess or the moment I tell the truth about what has happened, uh, I'm taking the car right to the airport. So this is the level of security threat that people are exposed to every day, um, where you try and have um, a transitional justice mechanism to bring a country out of out of conflict, but there is still conflict ongoing, which makes it just so very difficult. Um, so one of the victims slash survivors that I interviewed, let's call her Daisy, um, reflects on the establishment of institutions aimed at addressing the issues of forced disappearances, which is the most common narrative in the region. Uh, looking for closure when a family men member has been disappeared for so long. She expressed a belief that these initiatives were born out of a pressing need to locate missing individuals. You have a lot of families looking for someone within the region. Um, she, however, raises concerns about the inherent risks associated with engaging with institutions tasked with investigating disappearances. She fears reprisals for speaking out and emphasizes the necessity of robust security measures to mitigate these risks effectively. Um, I would say out of all the victims that I've 
interviewed, I would say 95% of them came in an in an in a bulletproof car with protection with two um how do you say it? with two security guards um organized by the state um and so uh colombia is quite a difficult setting to move around if you're a human rights defender um so also for them to just organize themselves security it takes sometimes a year or two to get approval by the capital city. One of the members of the search unit mentioned that they lose days traveling as they have to avoid certain areas within the Catatumbo region in order to get to certain parts um, of, the, of the country. So this makes their work oftentimes very little efficient because they just spend days traveling. Um, but they are, of course, bound by the security measures put in place by Bogota, um, and they have no other way to do it. Um, and also, she said that a lot of sites where families or relatives had pointed to saying, like, I think there might be the remains of someone who is missing. Um, they are just very difficult to access because of the presence of so many groups. Um, so... Um, the member of the search unit that I interviewed, she said that without the presence of the state in those territories, it is impossible to build peace. Um, and then as the last one that I wanted to mention is um, an expert that I interviewed um, um, who was actually the um, secretary of victims for Norte Santander, for the region, for the department. Um, he has in 2023, beginning of 2023, because of so many threats, he had to, let's say, uh, end his job as the secretary of victims. Um, and he has ever since fled the country. Um, so he is looking for political protection elsewhere and also a major of uh, one of the cities in the Catatumbo region has also left the country due to um, continuous threats. Um, and these are two very important figures if you want in the region because they organize protection for a lot of those that want to participate. They organize for victims to come to um, the capital of the, of the department uh, to testify with the Truth Commission. So if 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 a lot of a lot of times it comes down to individuals who support a certain cause and if they are missing because of threats, um, makes just everything else just more complicated. So just as a conclusion, um, you can see in Colombia, um, you have deviated from traditional practices, how Colombia has done peace agreements in the past. Um, we'll see how Colombia does peace with there's so many remaining groups. Um, of course, um, you have still guerrilla groups, but also you have a lot of narco trafficking groups in the region. Um, challenges at local level is that, well, as I said, a lack of security, an absence of the state, um, a lack of inclusion of a lot of regional realities that are at stake. And um, a lot of the people that I interviewed say that historical injustices just continue going and there's um, just not enough done to tackle the root causes of the conflict, which is a lot of times down to drugs and money and influence and power. So, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Kerry. Louise, I'll try and keep it short so there's also time for um, questions and, and discussions. Um, in your paper, you have an incredibly rich um, array of perspectives. Um, of you know your your different interviewees and um, what's what's very interesting with you know what you're doing and, and the approach you're taking is that you have alongside the voice of um, you know uh, an army veteran who's uh, committed violence and violations a perpetrator to use mm. that label alongside um, others who might or might not associate victims with victims, but might have been mm. victims um, in, in broader terms. So it's incredibly rich um, in that sense. My feeling was that what comes out of the paper most strongly is more the range of perception of what justice might mean to different individuals, groups, mm. etc. And so I, I felt like that could be teased out much more and could be linked back much more as well to the questions in the literatures around, you know, 
uh, linking it to peace as well is that a thing mm. how do we understand it and the multiplicity of that um, and, and the interlinkages between the two, um, especially because there's this underlying tension, which you obviously highlight in your paper around the reality of doing a transitional justice process in the midst of what is still an armed conflict, even though not necessarily with most of the FARC, but you have dissident mm. FARC groups and you have lots of other actors. Mm. Now, uh, in, in practical terms, in Colombia today, there's a very big shift with the PAS Total. So this is an effort by the current administration to negotiate peace with all mm -hmm. armed actors and not just political movement, but also criminal organizations, which is mm -hmm. particularly interesting <laughs> and innovative <laughs> and challenging, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it'd be really interesting to link it somehow, because in effect, the peace agreement with the FARC was with the FARC. Mm -hmm. It wasn't with all these other yeah. actors, right? And I think... Um, maybe to link to that, I think it would be helpful in the piece, but obviously if this is a bit of your thesis, it might not be relevant for that particular piece, but I think it would be really important to contextualize mm. um, both in terms of location and also historically. So for instance, there's quite a, a section on the killing of human rights leaders mm. and, and trade unionists and defenders and FARC leaders, etc. I think it's really hard to discuss that without discussing mm. the genocide of the Union Patriotica yeah. after the previous peace agreement with the FARC in the 1980s. Mm. Right? So there's a very good book by Andrea Gomez Suarez oh. on that, um, mm. you probably know. Um, also, in terms of uh, kind of historical context, I think, I think what you say about previous peace agreements in Colombia, I think you're right that they didn't lead to transitional justice and that there was amnesty, but there was a huge impact when it came to the actual judicial institutions in Colombia. Mm. So the negotiations with the M19, with all these other groups in the 90s, led to a complete revamp of the Corte Constitucional. Mm. It led to Afro-Colombian and indigenous people getting, you know, um, uh, group rights to their land and all of that, right? Mm. So there's a kind of it's a very interesting case of evolutions in the conflict and the negotiations hand in hand as well with kind of these judicial elements. And um, I think I'm I'm not I'm not completely convinced by your typification of the peace agreement as an inclusive process because it's actually a really classical elite level negotiation between a government and an armed group. It really was mm. quite secretive abroad, etc. Now. What was innovative were the victims' delegations were very innovative, mm. but it was about victims coming into that space, right? And then leaving that space. And actually, there's some really interesting work by Roddy Brett. I don't know if he's mm. published it yet or not. Um, I think it's coming out soon. He's at Bristol on the victims' delegation, their mm. experiences of, of that. So of being invited, but then, you know, so and, and the mm. kind of the effect that had on them and the re-traumatization, mm. but also kind of the frustrations mm. around it. And so I think. Um, I think there's a lot going on in the paper and I feel like you're, you know, the question is like, what's the overarching thread and what you can, you know, uh, really pull out. And I feel like there are a lot of the different voices of the victims. So the question is a bit like, what are the themes or the topics that are coming across? Is that what this is about? Or is it actual different experiences? Um, is it... Uh, going back to the point I was making around the perceptions of, of justice, or is it also about uh, this dynamic you're kind of implying around a tension between the kind of national level efforts of transitional justice and these big institutions, etc., mm. and then their reality on the ground in Norte Santander, you know, mm. like that kind of huge gap, uh, which I think is a really interesting realm. To, to, to explore because I think that's very much under investigated right mm. that kind of huge gap between that the formal if you like the peace agreement and that 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 reality very mm. much uh, at a much more localized level but if that's the case I think you might need to I'm not sure if you're comparing to other regions or not. I think the nature of Norte Santander, the fact that you have the FARC dissidents there, mm. you have the ELN very present in you know, the borders with, with Venezuela and a whole range of other groups, kind of makes it um, tricky, if you like, to kind of pull out um, the, the, the different um, threads. I think there's an underlying uh, topic as well linked to the regional elements around what you say around the 
presence of the state and governance. And I think I, I'd encourage you to dig more into that. Um, there has never been a presence of the state in most of these regions in Colombia. Governance functions came from these non-state armed mm. actors, and that's the whole reality of the FARC exiting. And you highlight the power vacuum, right? But then mm. what happens next? Mm. There's never been a positive presence of the state, as it mm. were. There are no set services or you know education mm. or all of that. And obviously, justice is almost like that first positive presence, if that makes sense. Right, that first idea that there might be access. So it's very interesting that tension between what you're highlighting, that willingness to to want that justice, but also the risks associated mm. with it. You know, mm. and I wonder as well on. Uh, I mean, your your interviews are so rich that I feel like you could also engage almost more with these micro dynamics, the mm. human element, the components. You know, the stories, the storytelling. I mean, I think the the work of uh, Roxani and Cristali and was in St. Andrews and, and Philip Schultz around that, around care and um, love and uh, kind of a much more um, emotional, for a better word, realm of the politics around that would be really interesting. Um, um, I think I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was really fascinating how the extent of which the papers speak to each other and how the voices come together and you see how the communication sometimes just does not work and how we can pinpoint this on different levels, mm. both the conceptual level, but then also the, on the political, local different levels of analysis. So um, before I start slipping into my lecture on my own, um, I'm going to open the floor and um, invite any questions, comments that you might have. I think he's just online online or in the room. And maybe introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. So first question is about the, the part on diplomacy with international actors and such as um, the South, Af South Africa and IRA. So I guess obviously ETA are, are not the Actors cautiously select those groups, and I, I guess because they were connected based in solidarity, uh, I imagine there is not much space for tension between these actors because they, I think, built on trust. So I just wonder whether any cases of being challenged, for example, from other organizations. I guess that internally there are conflicts, but externally, I think that might be some of the differences. Like orthodox diplomacy, because it's more about negotiation. And that in your case, it feels like more of a collaboration rather than like negotiation. And the second question is it's kind of my personal interest. I'm studying basically, I'm doing conceptual analysis of peace in the case of Japan, intervention in France. So I'm really, really curious about the concept of peace. And I'm also I'm right now looking at like withdrawal discourse of the UK and how it can be related to the peace. So my question is, sorry, is obviously as a result, ETA and all these independent movements are can be considered as maybe failure or defeat. So I want to, I guess it's about narrative. Mm -hmm. You can say it's for peace, it's peace process, but it's very one-sided. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether there is a narrative on peace where it's more about like, like liberation or emancipation or just because I think it's more relevant mm -hmm. concept in that aspect. So these are two, two of my uh, questions. Thank you. We take other ones in yeah. case yeah. and then yeah. just a footnote Sakshi was an ICS graduate as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or I think there was one uh, quite long one in the um, um, in the chat in okay. the Q and A. Um, Should I so maybe you start now? I'm even yeah. this one. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, just uh, on your second question first, um, I think that was a, a central tension was this idea even within ESA. The feeling was, well, if it's just us on our own, surely that's just like a surrender, right? It's just like accepting defeat. It's us giving up weapons with getting nothing in return. And what was really interesting was that um, 
it's within ETA, with the leadership, the, 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 the way the thinking shifted and evolved was to reframe it as um, it's an end of the armed strategy, but it's actually a success in political terms. And I think there were some very concrete political things that happened at the time of the transition that really shifted the perspective. So they were able to reform a, a political party that won a very big percentage of the vote and realize that actually um, giving up on the armed struggle was going to be much more beneficial for them um, in, in, in terms of votes. And now, you know, a lot of former political members, uh, former members of Batasuna are now in the Senate or, you know, in Parliament and they're kind of uh, negotiating at a, at a political level there, right? So the the, the kind of shift was um, more around um, what, like, the, the armed struggle is going against our, you know, interest to go into, like, irrational thinking around it, but that's kind of how they were expressing it to me, so that was, that was really interesting. Um, on the first point, um, what you're saying, which is interesting, is that you're saying in, in diplomatic settings, it can be more about um, uh, certain countries wanting certain things from someone else or pushing back on, on the others. You could say, for instance, that a lot of the, the, the non, like the conflict resolution organizations that were engaging with these actors, we're often trying to push certain issues around encouraging the group away from violence, right? Or challenging certain thinking or functions that kind of uh, were sometimes maybe a bit contentious as well. Um, but you're right that there's an interesting element that it might be quite different in terms of nature, right? Of contentious, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, the actors that are much more similar, like uh, Irish and Thane. I think we have a, a hand, which is um, our colleague Sama. So my question is for Sophie. Um, after you outlined your tentative argument that IR play a key role in transition of non-state armed groups, I was wondering what becomes of the goals of those armed groups that are in the process of transition. I. I'm asking this in the context of armed groups in South Asia in history that have then given up arms or transitioned to become state actors instead. They've always had some um, some political goal also that went with their armed nature. So I'm wondering in that process of transition, in your research, what you found to have become of their stated political goals in the process? They've remained exactly the same. So the, the political goals remain. And, and for instance, in the case of the Basque country, they're actually much closer to the political goals now that they were back in 2011, because of having gained a lot uh, politically in, in the ballot box, really. Like. So um, that, and that was a key part of the transition was this argument that we're not giving up on our political goals. We're giving up on the way, like certain ways that we've been trying to get to the goals. If that makes sense. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have um, two questions in, in, in the chat, um, and, and I think they could also re refer to um, to both um, presenters, um, which were from Russell and um, Cameron, and the, the kind of covering similar topics, which refer to the relationships between armed actors and the state, or the relationship between armed actors and the broader international order. Um, and I think the question would be, um, uh, does it matter what that relation is when it comes to the specific actor. So let's say we are talking about a non-state armed actor who is seeking sovereign recognition, or maybe um, um, an armed actor who's just driven by ideology or tries to is driven by political economic interests, um, but would not necessarily seek um, separate recognition um, per se. Does this have um, um, an impact on the kind of peace building uh, processes. There, there are quite long questions. Maybe you can go back to them um, because you have access to the chat. But uh, if you have any any responses, um, maybe just briefly, as uh, Sophie also mentioned about this idea of Paz Total in Colombia um, trying to negotiate uh, peace with all the armed groups. Um, and I find this. Um, I don't have an answer. It's just an observation that I had. It's just. 
how do you negotiate um, with the FARC differentiates, so it's, it's so different to how you negotiate with um, with a narco trafficking group um, because they have not a political interest as such as the FARC might have had. Um, while Sophie was presenting about how that differs then, essentially thinking the same thing, how does it differ if you if you are the FARC with a political agenda trying to also be a part of the government um, when you have diplomacy within the country, but also to the outside, um, um, and maybe talk more about ideology, but then I guess diplomacy might not be the same if you look at narco-trafficking groups, um, because of course there is a clear connection between uh, narco-trafficking groups in Colombia with the Mexican cartel, for example. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it does differ, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, I think the the kind of political criminal elements mm. is interesting. I mean, what what's happening in Colombia now is that they're they've decided to negotiate with all actors, but they've decided that certain things will not be negotiated with criminal mm. actors, and other things will be negotiated with political actors. So they're kind of separated out like that, which mm. I think is 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 really interesting because it hasn't really been approached. Um, until now. Uh, just going back to, to Russell's question, it seems like there's a, a link that has more as well to do with how um, kind of the engagement or endorsement of international actors, how that affects the constituency of a potential group, mm. uh, which I think is quite an interesting element. Um, so I think I think that's key. Um, and I think that's something that's often underexplored. So we don't often think of how the, act, the armed actor responds or even their constituency response. So, for instance, like other work I've, I've been doing on the impact of the terrorist label, we often assume that um, an armed actor is going to feel delegitimized by it or um, rejected by it. But for some armed actors, that's actually plays up for them, uh, for their constituency, right? It's almost like a badge of honor. It works like for Hamas or Hezbollah being considered a terrorist by the West is not negative, uh, you know, mm. politically for them. Um, but I think in the in this particular case, um, the, the kind of engagement at the international level, um, the role it played internally was more almost of reassurance. So it was kind of actors and people who the group itself and even the harder elements of the group, let's say, could recognize as having done similar things or being in the same group. So, you know, it's kind of a range of audiences, I guess, is, is, is the issue. Yeah. And I guess also the way the government had seen the FARC maybe in the 60s and 70s, and clearly, of course, the way they act has evolved over the years. But I guess also because in your book, Prescribing Peace, also the idea of Uriwe then saying, well, the FARC is a terrorist organization has quite drastically, I think, changed their image on a national and international level, which maybe has made it either harder or more difficult to negotiate as well, because suddenly everyone knows who they are and probably maybe also gave them somewhat more of a, a platform, maybe even on a political level. I don't know. Maybe building on what? Sense, 
in some respects, legitimate, not normative, not normative, not normatively in terms of morality, but in terms of maybe structure and maybe in terms of the impact of the international stage. Doesn't have the how does that impact the, 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 these kind of blurred lines that have behind how we see legitimacy on, on the world stage? Because you might have, you know, if you look at a country like Iran, where it, you know it's both has an impact on the world stage and it's a state, so it's you know it has a bureaucracy. Um, but it doesn't necessarily reveal as you read it, not necessarily it might be kind of stigmatized. It just sort of blurs the distinctions between what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. And so I'm wondering whether there would be like conceptually maps of how they would work in terms of on legitimacy. Yeah, I think legitimacy is central to, to these questions. Um, I think, I mean, maybe more than this, but just going back to some of the previous work I've done on the terrorist stigma. That's exactly what it is, right? It's uh, an immediate delegitimization of any engagement with that particular actor that has been particularly focused on non-state actors uh, since 9-11, especially, right? Um, but the thing is, is that, as I was saying before, these actors also have a range of audiences or other states or actors that they can engage with, you know. Um, so, for instance, if you look at Hezbollah, well, they have Iran or they have, you know, they, they're people outside of that realm of the stigmatizers, if you like, right? So there are also different parallel also international societies, I guess, um, that that's kind of important to, to, to bear in mind. But of course, the whole process of engaging diplomatically with these actors it's just not done right it's not it's deeply problematic and it's flawed and so i think that's also why it's under researched or under understood because it's very much done in secrecy or in the margins it's criminalized right so that's the whole thing uh, but it does happen and so that's i guess why i'm interested in like how it happens and 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 particularly for me a big lesson of this story is that when it does happen, it does seem to play a really important role in the move of these groups away from violence, right? So strategically, it might be a really valuable thing to be doing, I guess, is, is one of the lessons that's coming out here. I'm just very yeah. pleased for, about the question because I wanted to ask exactly about uh, the stigmatization element um, to it. And what I find interesting about the, the, the two papers, so you could read them as different ways of dealing with stigma and coming from the state Kind of looking for alternative sources for legitimacy for for um, authority um, by finding this other hand for 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 the clapping. In your case, it seems to be like the peace process is now kind of leading to this explosion of different forms of stigmatization of of, of threats now being issued from the local, from the regional level, from uh, so, so so almost as if if you look at the ETA case where you had to have this agreement. So we're going to change our role. We're going to go into a more um, proactive peace approach. In your case, it's the other way around. So now you have a peace process and you have victims supposed to be speaking out. What happens? You have more stigmatization, but from 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 the from the bottom up. I think also, I mean, a lot of a lot of the victims that I have spoken to uh, say there's a stigma towards them as well as to their own person to where they are coming from, very difficult. Just also a part of the stigma idea is that so difficult for them maybe to get work because it's like, oh, where do you come from? Oh, I come from this region and there's just so, such a stigma with the region as well. And I think also now that also other groups are speaking up more about what has occurred in the past, of course, also somewhat maybe delegitimizes that group as well. If you think about the military, there's also always a bit of a rumor, and you know what 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 is the Colombian military really doing? And now that people actually, like in the public sphere, talk about this more, of course, gives the military also a very different um, stigma, if you want, but also like a very different idea of 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 their work. Um, and so, yeah. See, it's it's. But also, I was thinking, who gets to decide? which group is what because um i have spoken to former combatants of the elin uh, which is still an active group and if you speak to them and if you speak to former farc members it's a completely different kind of conversation um even though you think the elin to the outside at least is a politically driven group but if you speak to them it doesn't seem like it really is um, if 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 I compare to the interviews that I've done with the FARC, 
um, at least that was my 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 experience during the interviews. Mm. Okay, we have been out of time now. Um, so thank you so much for um, everybody's um, participation. Of course, so um, the speaker Vivian had to to leave us a bit earlier, but thank you so much for a really insightful um, afternoon talk. Thanks to everyone for joining us um, remotely and in person.